Good morning. Welcome to our Morning Moment with Jesus devotional for Thursday, November the 12th. Good to have you with us this morning. Appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to uh, spend a few moments with us in opening up the Word of God and looking at the life of Jesus, our Savior. We're going to begin with a word of prayer, and uh, then we'll get into looking at part one of the burial of Jesus' body. Father, we're so grateful for your blessings in our lives. We thank you for the past night's rest, for the new day that lies before us. Father, I ask you bless us this day as we go about our activities, that we might accomplish the things that we need to do, that we might see opportunities that come our way of service, opportunities of speaking for you, of telling others about the good news of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Father, continue to be with us as we look at this very traumatic time uh, in the life of Christ upon this earth. We saw his death yesterday and today and tomorrow. We're going to look at his burial. And we just pray, Father, that as we are reminded of these things and as we take a look at them, that it will just continue to stress to us and emphasize to us the great sacrifice that he made on our behalf that we might not have to die spiritually and be eternally separated from you. Thank you for your plan, for your love, for your mercy and grace, for his willingness in love and mercy and grace to carry out your plan on our behalf. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Jesus' death makes possible our salvation. Romans 5 verse 10. It is one of the three cardinal facts of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 and 3. The other two are his burial and his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4. In the section of our study that we begin now, we're going to cover uh, the closing hours of Friday which we just did yesterday when Christ dies, Saturday when his body lay in the tomb, and the first part of Sunday where he arose from the dead. That'll be today, tomorrow, and the first lesson or two next week. These three days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, are the most important days in history. For what took place on those three days is at the heart of our hope. As we begin this morning, let's talk about his death viewed. If you have your Bibles there with you, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. I want to read some two verses from chapter 27, and then we're going to read one verse from Mark, or two verses rather, from Mark and one from Luke. Matthew 27 verses 55 and 56. Many women were there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee while ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now, in Mark's account, we want to look at chapter 15 and verses 40 and 41. Mark chapter 15, verses 40 and 41. There were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James the Less, and Joseph, and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him. And there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And now one final verse for, this, for the moment, and that is in Luke chapter 23 and verse uh, 49. Luke 23 verse 49. 
And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance, seeing these things. During the crucifixion, four women were standing by the cross. His mother, his mother's sister, probably named Salome, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When John took Christ's mother from the scene, John 19, 27, the other women moved to the edge of the crowd. These precious women who had ministered to the Lord in Galilee, as we read Mark 15, 41, see also Luke 8, verses 2 and 3, did not abandon him at his death. They were the last at his cross and the first at his tomb. At least two were witnesses of his death, burial, Matthew 27, verse 60, verse 61, Mark 15, 47, and Luke 23, 55, and his resurrection, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 10. So we've seen his death viewed. Now we want to talk about his death confirmed. Turn with me to do this to John, John's Gospel. John chapter 19, we want to read verses 37, 31 through 37. John chapter 19, verses 31 through 37. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your own law. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death, to fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was to die. Excuse me, I just realized I'm in chapter 18, not chapter 19. So let's move over to chapter 19, verses 31 through 37. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that the legs might be broke, like their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe it. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture sa says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Pilate granted the Jews request to break the legs of those crucified, and he sent the orders to Calvary. Verse 32 says, so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and the other who was crucified with him. This grisly task was done with a club or a heavy mallet. Verse 33 then says, but coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. The soldiers did not merely assume that Jesus had died. To make sure that he was dead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, John 19, 34a. Now this was not just a skin prick to see if Jesus twitched. The spear was thrust through his side deep into his chest cavity. 
resulting in a ghastly wound, which the hand into which into which the hand could be placed. John 20 verses 25, 27. Since soldiers were held accountable for determining that a victim was dead before he was removed from the cross, the spear was probably forced between the ribs from an upward angle up into the heart. And this would cause a fatal wound, which was probably taught to most Roman soldiers. The soldier with his own life at stake was assuring himself and the guard that Jesus was dead beyond any shadow of doubt. The fact that Jesus' bones were not broken fulfilled an Old Testament prophecy according to John 19 verse 36. And that prophecy is found in Psalm 34 verse 20. The fact that Jesus' bones were not broken was also an important uh, was also in, important to conform to the imagery of the Passover lamb. The fact that his side was pierced also fulfilled prophecy. John quotes Zechariah 12 and verse 10 in John 19, 37. When Christ's side was opened by the spear, immediately blood and water came out. John 19, 34, B. Now, since corpses do not bleed, many commentators have labored to find a medical explanation for this phenomenon. The most popular explanation is that the discharge of these bodily fluids indicated, indicates that Jesus died of a broken, ruptured heart. A shortcoming of most medical explanations is that they assume that when Jesus died, his body began the natural process of decomposition produced by death. However, both Peter and Paul insisted that Christ's flesh did not suffer decay. Acts 2 verse 31 and see also Acts 13 verse 37. Early Christian writers saw in the blood and water mystical symbolism. Many saw in the blood and water the ordinances of the Lord's Supper and baptism, which came from Jesus. Some connected John 19, 34 with a perplexing passage in 1 John 5, verse 6 and 8. However, there is no indication in John 19, 34 that this kind of figurative interpretation was intended. We should probably just accept the blood and the water as part of the total mystery of Jesus' death for our sins, and leave it at that. John, who apparently recognized that the blood and the water detail went, went contrary to human experience, added his personal testimony regarding the accuracy of the account. John 19, verse 34. John's vivid description serves one purpose, to show that Jesus was really dead, that he did not merely faint to be revived later, later by his disciples. The idea that Jesus just fainted is a fanciful theory put forth by some who deny the resurrection. It is usually called the swoon theory. Jesus died about 3 p.m. See Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50. A few hours before sundown, which would be the beginning of the Sabbath. 
anticipating the approach of a new day at approximately 6 p.m. that evening. John 19.31 says, The Jews, the Jewish leaders, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, ask Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Now this is a long verse and it deserves some explanation. The day of preparation, the day before the Sabbath, the sixth day, roughly equivalent to our Friday, was a day of preparation for the Sabbath, the seventh day, roughly equivalent to our Saturday. So that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, John tells us. Now the law said, if we go back in the Old Testament, if you want to turn there with me, we're going to go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, and we're going to read verses 22 and 23 and see what the law exactly said. Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 and 23. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day, for he who is hanged is, is accursed of God, so that you do not defile your land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Joshua 8 verse 29 and Joshua 10 verse 26 and 27 can also help us with regard to that. The hanging on a tree in this passage in Deuteronomy 21 is probably a reference to hanging someone by the neck with a rope or to impaling someone on a stake. But the Jews also applied the passage to one being crucified. See Galatians 3 verse 13. According to Deuteronomy 21 then, those who died on Golgotha that Friday had to be buried before sundown. Many writers also believe that the Jews had an un uninspired tradition that to leave the bodies on the crosses on the Sabbath would defile the Sabbath itself. John also tells us that that Sabbath was a high day. The original text has, the day of that Sabbath was great. The New International Version translates the phrase, a special Sabbath. Now, all Sabbaths were important, but a Sabbath that fell during the Passover was extra special. Also, this particular Sabbath had added significance because it was the start of the week-long Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, as we have noted earlier, the one-day Passover feast was immediately followed by the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, by New Testament times, these two feasts had blended together and were known by both names, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. John then tells us that the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken. The Romans preferred that the executed suffer for days, but when circumstances demanded, they could hasten the death by breaking the legs of the victims. Since those on the crosses had to push themselves up with the leg, their, their legs in order to breathe, when their legs were broken, they soon died of asphyxiation. John then says they, the request was that they may be taken away. The Jewish leaders not only asked that the Romans hasten the death of those on the cross 
but they also wanted the Romans to dispose of the bodies. The Jewish hierarchy refused to make themselves ceremonially unclean by touching a dead body. See Numbers 19 verse 11. The Romans no doubt had a burial policy plot, a burial plot, where the bodies of criminals could be tossed into unmarked graves. Once more, the Jewish leaders showed their hypocrisy and inconsistency. They had not hesitated to crucify the Lord of the Sabbath, Matthew 12, verse 8, Mark 2, verse 28. But now they are concerned with defiling the Sabbath itself. Well, we're going to stop at that point, and tomorrow we'll be back at 10 o'clock and continue looking at the burial of Jesus' body. He's not going to be just thrown into an unmarked grave with like the other two who were crucified with him. But we'll see that as we look further tomorrow. Let's bow as we close in prayer. Father, we thank you again for the death of Jesus, for the life that he lived prior to that death, for the sacrifice that that death made for our sins on our behalf, for his blood that was shed that we might be cleansed of sin. Father, may we be reminded of all of that and strengthened and encouraged in our faith as we reflect upon it again this day. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll go out and make your Thursday a great one. And Lord willing, we'll be back tomorrow morning on Friday at 10 o'clock to continue looking at the burial of Jesus' body.